North Korea is possibly one of the most secretive and shut down nations on Earth. In order to maintain control over the people and the image of the country as a whole, the totalitarian regime has a whole bunch of crazy rules and unpleasant punishments. Today, we're going to take a look at 20 bizarre things that only exist in North Korea. Number 20. Female Soldiers in North Korea Life in North Korea is essentially a string of massive human rights violations for pretty much all of its citizens every day of their entire lives. People of all ages are exploited and punished with insanely harsh measures for so-called crimes or anything that's seen as subversive in a controlling totalitarian regime. So it's rough wherever you are and whatever you do in your daily life. But women who are a part of the North Korean military are at even greater risk of exploitation and abuse than other members of society. In addition to the horrible things that North Korean soldiers have to go through, there's an additional layer of oppression, especially for these female military personnel. Back in 2015, it was made mandatory for women aged 17 to 20 to do military service in North Korea. They're then required to serve until they reach 23 years of age. And as much as the military in this oppressive nation is unpleasant for all soldiers, there are specific conditions that affect women in particular. They are subjected to brutal physical punishments, sexual assault, and they may be forced to have abortions. These are often self-inflicted or incredibly dangerous because they live in fear, and they often have to survive without feminine hygiene products. As is typical of any society that abuses its women, these soldiers are also threatened to keep silent and are shamed on a regular basis as a form of control. Women are treated as second-class citizens in general, as the patriarchal structure of the military likes to emphasize gender roles. So, despite the fact that women will be subjected to the same intense training as the men during the day, they're also required to attend all that domestic duty stuff afterwards as well. They'll be made to cook and clean and are belittled and berated simply because they're women. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 19. Human Waste is Fertilizer North Korea has apparently been suffering from a shortage of fertilizer for its crop. In general, this is imported from China, but in times of limited supply, they've turned to their own citizens to make the manure. Ew. Yes, according to some news reports, North Koreans are encouraged by their leadership to use their own poop to fertilize the fields. It is a serious business as well, because without good fertilizer, the crops are going to fail, and in a country that suffers from food shortages at even the best of times, adding one's own waste to the pile may actually save a nation from a widespread famine. Of course, this is not usually a recommended method for growing crops, but in the dark days of border closures in 2020, Chinese supplies were unavailable, so it became increasingly essential for this inward-looking nation with very few friends to find its way to feed itself. The burden of fertilizer production therefore falls on the citizens of North Korea. In fact, they're given quotas to fulfill in time for farming season. Households were finding these quotas extremely difficult to achieve, 220 pounds per year to be exact which might be possible when you're well-fed, but when you're already on substance rations, how do you even manage to poop this much? That would certainly require an awful lot of fiber. Number 18. The subway is a bomb shelter. Pyongyang's metro system reaches a depth of 360 feet and serves as both a transportation network and a potential nuclear bunker during times of conflict. The underground train system consists of two lines that span a combined length of 18 miles beneath the capital city of North Korea. Construction on this metro line began in 1968 and would be officially inaugurated in 1973 by Kim Il-sung, the grandfather of current leader Kim Jong-un. The trains themselves were acquired from Germany in 1999, and despite North Korea's later claims of having manufactured them domestically, 
Graffiti tags from their previous origin can still be seen on the carriages. The metro stations bear names that are associated with the revolution. That includes Comrade, Red Star, Glory, Liberation, Signal Fire, Rehabilitation, Victory, Paradise, and Restoration. As commuters descend into the depths, they are then immersed in revolutionary music and patriotic songs that play all throughout the loudspeakers. While the metro is ordinarily bustling with commuters, its depth, the deepest in the world apparently, and its robust infrastructure make it a potential shelter for citizens in the event of escalated tensions and conflict or even a full-scale war with any of its enemies. Access to the subway system has traditionally been restricted to foreigners, but recently Pyongyang has organized limited tours for foreign media. These visits are designed to demonstrate to the world the preparedness and resolve of the North Korean regime, and this is what most access to the country is about. It's always heavily staged, managed, and presented in a completely choreographed way in order to fulfill the North Korean narrative and send a message to their would-be aggressors. Number 17. Different Basketball Rules In a country that literally makes up all of its own rules, regardless of what the rest of the world says or does, it should come as absolutely no surprise that North Korea also does sports in its very own and special way as well. Kim Jong-un is famously a massive fan of basketball, and before him, his father was also pretty into it as well. This makes for quite an awkward sort of situation when it comes to such an American sport being such a big part of the North Korean culture, and so they've changed it up. Former NBA star Dennis Rodman's close relationship with North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un has led to speculation about his involvement in the creation of unique basketball rules in North Korea. According to some newspaper reports, North Korea introduced an intriguing scoring system. In this system, slam dunks hold a value of three points, while field goals made in the last three minutes of the game are worth a whopping eight points. Adding to all of that excitement, three-pointers can earn four points if the ball swishes through the net without touching the rim. However, a missed free throw? Well, that results in death due to embarrassment. No, I'm just kidding. It's a deduction of one point from the team's overall score. These unconventional rules further emphasize North Korea's desire to innovate and do their own thing, as well as adding excitement to the sometimes boring game of basketball. Number 16. The World's Largest Stadium The Rangrado 1st of May Stadium, located in Pyongyang, North Korea, is an architectural marvel, and it actually holds the title of being the largest stadium in the world. Built in 1989, the colossal venue can accommodate as many as 150,000 spectators. The stadium's name refers to the International Workers' Day in reference to the country's dedication to the labor movement. Its design is unusual, with a distinct flower petal shape and a roof that resembles a giant magnolia blossom. Not limited to sports events, the stadium is a multifunctional facility that hosts a wide range of performances and mass rallies. Its grandeur and capacity make it an ideal venue for showcasing North Korean cultural and political events. That also includes the famous Ararang Mass Games. It is an important part of the propaganda and political narrative in this country, full of controversy and, well, let's be honest, severe human rights violations. The stadium's sheer size is awe-inspiring, and the atmosphere during events is allegedly electric. Apparently, it has state-of-the-art facilities, which includes a running track, a football pitch, and multiple tiers of seating. And beyond its features, the stadium serves as a symbol of North Korea's national pride. It stands as a testament to the country's commitment to monumental achievements and their desire to create a stage for showcasing their cultural heritage. Number 15. Pyongyang's Version of Paris North Korea loves to commemorate the heck out of everything. Even if what they claim to be commemorating is a bit of a dubious recollection of events, and mainly focuses on the glorious leadership of their dictators both past and present. But that fact, or lack thereof, does not diminish their passion for massive statues and huge symbolic constructions. This is one such massive memorial, or reminder of a great glory or whatever they call it. It's a 200-foot tall arch of triumph, and is based on the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, but naturally, it is significantly bigger. This particular arch was built back in 1982 in Pyongyang, 
and was erected in honor of former leader Kim Il-sung's fight for Korean independence. It was officially opened on his 70th birthday, and they even made it from 25,500 blocks of white granite, each one representing a day of his life for the previous 70 years. Well, he was nothing if not humble, you know. Number 14. You can only browse 28 websites. Access to the internet in North Korea is heavily restricted due to the government's paranoia. Merely owning a computer also requires permission from local authorities, and all personal computers have to be registered with the police. Even possessing pirated DVDs of South Korean television dramas is also illegal and can result in years of labor camp sentencing. Internet rules in North Korea are amongst the most stringent in the world. The government tightly controls online access to maintain its grip to information flow and to prevent dissent. Internet access is highly restricted and limited to a small portion of the population, primarily the government officials and trusted individuals. Online activities are closely monitored and unauthorized content or accessing foreign websites is strictly prohibited. Private ownership of fax machines is banned, and sending faxes requires high-level authorization. North Korea's internet infrastructure is isolated from the global network, which creates a highly censored and monitored intranet accessible only within the country. These strict rules aim to maintain state control while preventing the spread of information that may challenge the government's narrative or ideology. Number 13. No Blue Jeans Allowed Back in 2021, reports began to come out of North Korea that there were some new rules regarding clothing. Now, we've already heard about the haircuts that are allegedly part of the same plan by the leader of the country, and generally, it's believed that Kim Jong-un has introduced some laws to determine what people in the country may or may not wear. It's said to be an attempt by the dictator to control the spread of what he believes to be symbols of a capitalistic lifestyle. Now, one of those items of clothing that has been determined to be unacceptably Western and capitalist at the same time in its stylings are skinny jeans. The reports say that this stuff has been published in the North Korean official newspaper, where the government has printed an article in which they state that they have to be wary of even the slightest sign of capitalist lifestyle and fight to get rid of them. This may seem like an extreme stance to take when it comes to leg wear, but then again, this regime is famously extreme, so it stands to reason. In recent years, there have been more and more fashion items in the skinny jeans department that are available to men, so perhaps this is actually a good rule after all. <laughs> I mean, have you seen just how tight those things can be? Nobody needs to see that much. Ah, oh, my eyeballs! Number 12. Strict Control of Electronics As another element of the severe paranoia of the North Korean leadership is their extremely stringent rules about portable electronics. They are so very concerned about so-called security issues that they keep a tight grip on who can even have a laptop. Back in 2017, they freaked out so much that they issued a directive that severely restricted the use of laptops and any kind of portable technology even in government offices as well as everywhere else. That included bans on the use of old laptops. Apparently, there had been a big problem with these machines being stolen, and that made the government extra twitchy. They say that they fear secret information being leaked, but in all honesty, they're equally as concerned about any kind of outside influence finding its way into the country. Keeping people ill-informed and under control is an essential part of a totalitarian power, after all. Number 11. Kim Jong-un Hates K-Pop North Korea has implemented a ban on K-Pop, the popular music genre from South Korea. The ban is part of the government's more broad strategy to control cultural influences and maintain ideological purity within the country. K-Pop, with its catchy tunes, vibrant performances, and global popularity, has gained a significant following worldwide especially in neighboring South Korea. However, the North Korean government perceives it as a threat to its regime. Fearing that its Western-influenced style might undermine its strict control over the populace. In recent years, there have been reports of North Korean citizens being arrested and punished for even possessing or distributing K-pop, 
The government considers it a form of cultural invasion and views its lyrics and themes as potentially subversive. The ban on K-pop is part of a larger effort to limit exposure to foreign influence, particularly from South Korea, and North Korea tightly controls its media, heavily censors content to ensure it aligns with the government's ideology. The ban extends to other South Korean cultural products, such as TV shows and movies, further isolating North Korean society from external influence. While the North Korean government's measures aim to maintain control, they've not completely eradicated the popularity of K-pop within the country. Illicit distribution of K-pop music and videos does still occur through underground channels, highlighting the resilience and appeal of the genre despite the ban. The thing is, though, a ban on K-pop doesn't actually sound like too terrible of an idea to me. That stuff is super annoying. Number 10. The Three Generation Punishment Rule North Korea has a notorious practice known as the Three Generations of Punishment. This rule targets not only individuals who commit a crime, but also their immediate family members, spanning up to three generations. It would be introduced in 1950 and was designed to eliminate the possibility of counter-revolutionary North Koreans having any blood relatives left to avenge them or even continue with the tradition of dissent. If someone is found guilty of a political offense or deemed to be disloyal to the regime, that punishment will extend to their children and even their grandchildren in the future. This collective punishment aims to suppress dissent by instilling fear while discouraging any form of opposition. Under the rule, individuals and their families can face imprisonment, forced labor, or even execution. The rationale behind this severe punishment is to eradicate any potential resistance by eradicating entire bloodlines. This practice reinforces the regime's grip on power while also ensuring compliance through fear. Number 9. The Dream Job for Women In the bustling intersections of Pyongyang, the capital city of North Korea, you're going to find a unique group of individuals that are known as the traffic ladies. These women, officially called traffic security officers, have become an emblematic image of the city. Selected for their looks in a society that values tradition, they play a vital role in managing the flow of traffic. Interestingly, there's a catch to being a traffic lady. If they marry, then they have to leave their position and their time in the role is limited as mandatory retirement awaits them at the young age of just 26. This policy ensures a constant stream of photogenic young women as North Korean authorities strive to present them in the most favorable light to the outside world. Originally introduced in the 1980s when vehicles were scarce on the streets, the traffic ladies have adapted their role to the changing times. Even in the past, when the boulevards were wide and empty, they had directed imaginary cars with precision and energy, creating a somewhat surreal scene. These traffic ladies, with their distinctive uniforms and commanding presence, have become a regular subject for visiting tourists and journalists, mostly, one would assume, on the account that they are deliberately presented to be viewed as a positive representation of North Korea. But who knows, really? Maybe this is all just the most interesting and important thing for reporters to write about. Who could possibly say? Number 8. A Different Calendar North Korea doesn't even use the same calendar as the rest of us. Really? The North Korean calendar was created in 1997 and is the official calendar of North Korea, named after an ideology which emphasizes self-reliance and independence. It marks the beginning of a new era, denoting the year 1912 as the starting point. That would be the birth of the year of the country's founder. In this calendar, the Gregorian calendar is not completely discarded, but rather used right alongside of it. The conversion between the two calendars is achieved by adding or subtracting 1911 years. For instance, the year 2023 in the Gregorian calendar is referred to as 112, in the North Korean. Other notable dates include the Day of the Shining Star, which is Kim Jong-il's birthday, and the Day of the Foundation of the Republic, celebrating the establishment of North Korea. While this calendar is officially followed in North Korea, the Gregorian calendar remains widely in use for international communication and interactions with other countries. Nevertheless, the North Korean calendar holds cultural significance and serves as a symbol of national identity. 
It offers a distinctive perspective on time and reflects the nation's aspirations for self-determination and autonomy. Number 7. Abandoned Hotel The Rugyong Hotel in Pyongyang, North Korea, is an intriguing architectural marvel that not only seems to be a symbol of the ambition of the North Korean leadership to portray the nation as prosperous, but it's also a moldering reminder of the failure of that very ambition itself. But while the hotel was initially intended to house hotel rooms, restaurants, and other amenities, its interior remains largely unknown to the public. In recent years, there have been reports of renovation efforts and plans to finally open the hotel to guests. Although details remain scarce, there are many rumors and speculations, but like most things in North Korea, nobody can say for sure about, well, anything at all. And add to that, why does North Korea need a hotel so big anyways? It's not like they let anybody inside. Number 6. Weird New Year's Gifts what is a suitable gift for the new year? Or perhaps even a graduation or a birthday? Something shiny, perhaps? Or maybe a lovely book? How about some crystal meth? <laughs> what now? That's right, North Korea is allegedly a country where people will frequently exchange gifts for the Lunar New Year, and their top trending gift is methamphetamine because of course it is. According to some sources, the state-sponsored production of drugs, especially methamphetamine, has been increasing since the 1990s. Is this another symptom of their weird paranoia? They fear so much the use of foreign influences, including the smuggling of drugs, that they will make their own thank you very much. Apparently, this drug is basically extremely common at this point, given that it's a gift is pretty normalized. It has the sort of status of some kind of energy booster, like a Red Bull multiplied, but for some reason, North Koreans seem to really underestimate the dangers of the drug. Maybe that's because they literally have no access to information except about how awesome their leader is. But, you know, who could possibly say? Number 5. Actual Fashion Police what citizens are permitted to wear in North Korea is kind of unofficial, but there are definitely rules that are strongly recommended about what clothing is acceptable, and there are even people who will enforce these rules. Individual choice is not really a thing in North Korea. Clothing is considered to be an area in which a person may express themselves, and in this country, that is all but forbidden. The fashion police is actually a thing. If a person is seen wearing something deemed to be western or exotic, they will likely be stopped in the street and scolded. Then if they continue to commit the infraction, they'll likely be looked at more closely by authorities, and in the worst outcomes, can even be sent to do forced labor. All for wearing a jaunty hat or a snazzy pair of shoes. And we are not really talking about solid gold sneakers or some kind of Lady Gaga ensemble. This is even for the most tame of items, really. Number 4. The Propaganda Village In 1953, following the signing of the Korean Armistice Agreement between North Korea, China, and the United Nations, a demilitarized zone was established between North Korea and South Korea. This area was designed to act as a buffer zone between the two nations and also as the midway dividing line of the Korean Peninsula. <laughs> The demilitarized zone, known as the DMZ, is 160 miles long and two and a half miles wide. In this area, it's basically forbidden for anyone to enter. It's used as a meeting point for high-ranking officials from each side of the border, but nobody else is allowed to enter this highly restricted area. The meetings for negotiations take place at the small joint security area located near the western end of the DMZ, and the entire thing is a hotbed of tension despite the fact that it's supposed to be completely neutral and there have been incidents in which there have been casualties, both military and civilian, from both sides of the barrier. The areas immediately around the DMZ are significant on both sides. Each nation keeps what are known as peace villages in sight of each other's sides of the DMZ. These places on both sides were created to appear luxurious while also emphasizing a kind of lifestyle that was basically phony and just for show, not to mention unheard of in either nation during the 1950s when they were established. They remain, to this day, areas where the appearance is the most important thing to maintain a visual presence in the backyard of the opposition being the main idea. A sort of international, extremely high-stakes keeping up with the Joneses. Number 3. 
caste system based on loyalty. North Korea essentially grades its citizens based on their and their families' loyalty to the regime. This is known as a person's songbun, and the people with the highest get the best treatment, the nicest places to live, the best food, that means imported, and the best education for their children. Those with a low songbun have been literally purged in previous regimes, and the three-generation rule means that families can live with the wrongs of their ancestors, affecting their chances for decades. The entire system is divided into three classes, being core, wavering, and hostile, and there are even further categories within each. But the general idea is that the more you suck up to the regime, the better you'll get on in life. Number 2. Cure for Diseases Back in 2015, North Korean news agencies released an announcement that the country had developed a drug that cured AIDS, Ebola, and even cancer. Thank you, Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Grandma. It sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? That's because it is. The announcement did not go into great detail, but vaguely mentioned the use of ginseng and other ingredients that are grown from fertilizer, hopefully not the kind that we've heard about before. This, like many other things that the dictatorship has claimed over the years, is a lot of old hogwash. The invention of the so-called wonder drug, Comdang 2, would change the world, if only it wasn't make-believe propaganda to make the regime seem awesome. Number 1. Television If there were ever an indication that North Korea is a land that is massively inferior, then surely it's demonstrated in their television. <laughs> TV is, as we all know, the most important marker of a civilization. Where would the United States be without such gems as The Bachelor, Keeping Up with the Kardashians, and The Apprentice? These are the shows that have made America into the glorious and intellectual powerhouse that it is today. Now, at least Americans are free to make garbage television and fill their heads with as much of this trash as they please, if that is indeed freedom. In North Korean television, though, it serves a powerful propaganda tool for the country's government, reflecting its ideology and promoting the cult of personality that surrounds its leaders. It operates under the control of the state and strictly adheres to government guidelines and censorship. The content of North Korean television revolves around glorifying the country's leadership, particularly that of the Kim family dynasty. The broadcasts will often feature grandiose displays of loyalty and obedience to the ruling regime. Shows and documentaries also highlight the achievements and virtues of Kim Jong-un and his predecessors, presenting them as infallible leaders. The programming on North Korean television heavily emphasizes patriotism, socialism, and the ideology News broadcasts will depict it as a strong and prosperous nation, while portraying foreign countries, particularly the United States and South Korea, as enemies and aggressors. Entertainment programs typically consist of traditional music and dance performances, along with some dramatic representations that reinforce the government's narratives. Western cultural influences are largely absent, and the content is tightly controlled to ensure that it aligns with state ideology. The viewing choices are, of course, limited, and censorship is pervasive, with the government aiming to maintain strict control over the information that reaches the citizens. But at least they don't have to watch endless commercials for the hemorrhoid creams and Martha Stewart talking about her Medicare coverage. They probably save those for their prison punishments, I would assume. Well, that's all from today's peep over the fence into North Korea. What did you think about all the bizarre stuff? Could you even live like this? As always, let me know your thoughts in the comments section down below. Be sure to check out the other cool things showing up on the screen, and I'll see you next time.